Let's talk about pH in the soil. We've talked around it and we've referenced it many times, but here's where we're gonna talk about what exactly is pH and how does pH in the soil have an impact on growing plants. So here on our title card, we have two images and these are both of the same species of plant. This is hydrangea, a common garden plant. We typically see it most in the blue flowered form, but this is one of the plants that uh, will change flower color based on soil pH. So in acid soils, you have the blue or purple color, and in alkaline soils, you have the, the pink or reddish color. And so what's really happening is at different pH levels, you have certain ions that are available or unavailable. And in this case with hydrangea, it's aluminum. And aluminum ions become available in acidic soil. And that's what changes the flower color to bluish or purple. Whereas in alkaline soil, the aluminum ions are tied up, not soluble, not available to the plant. And so we have a result of pink flowers, kind of an interesting uh, situation. And uh, you can, there's different cultivated varieties that favor different flower color and not every species of hydrangea has this characteristic and there's white flowers as well. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's a really good illustration of how pH can make a difference in your soil. So first of all, what is pH? A lot of people say it is percentage hydrogen or parts hydrogen, which is not technically correct. It's close. Uh, basically, it's a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. And we have discussed ions as being particles or molecules that have a charge. And so that charge can be positive or negative. And based on the concentration of hydrogen ions, uh, you will have either acidic or basic pH values. Now, this is on a scale of zero to 14, which is kind of complicated. We'll explain why in a moment. And neutral is seven. And we will discover that this is a logarithmic scale, which means that each number is 10 times the value of the number before it. So if seven is zero, then six would be 10 times on the acidic side, and eight would be 10 times on the basic side. Nine would be 100 times, 10 would be 1,000 times. So as you go further out into the more extreme numbers, very low or very high, away from seven, it gets much more concentrated with hydrogen ions. So in the soil, we don't usually say acidic or basic. That's more for a kind of a liquid measurement in chemistry. In the soil, we tend to say acidic or alkaline. And alkaline means the same thing as basic, it just means you're higher than pH seven. So for acidic soils, they have a larger concentration of hydrogen ions, which is H plus than those that are alkaline. The more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic your soil will be. And so here's a very simplified version of hydrogen. Now, this is kind of an old fashioned way of thinking about atoms. We know that it's much more complicated than this, but the basic level of understanding works for us to explain pH. So we'll stick with the outdated model of the atom and we'll forget about quantum mechanics. But in general, we've got uh, a hydrogen atom, which is the smallest of the atoms. 
it has the atomic number of one, which means it contains one single proton and one electron. So the proton has the positive charge, the electron has the negative charge. You can think of it like the electron orbiting around the proton, although that's not exactly true, but it works for this story of pH. And so that electron balances out the charge of the proton. You have positive and negative. You put the two together and it's neutrally charged. However, because the electron is not physically attached, it's just in the same space, that electron can be pulled away by another ion, another charged particle. And if and when that happens, you're left with a single proton, which is positively charged, H+. So what we're measuring with pH is the concentration of single protons, H+. Now in our soil, the pH will govern the availability of various plant nutrients. Because we've talked about how plant nutrients must be taken in in the form of ionic compounds which means they are soluble in water. They can dissolve and be pulled in through the plant's roots. So at different pH levels in the soil, there will be different rates at which these ionic compounds will dissolve in water. So if you look at the table on the right, you can see we've got terminology to describe soil pH and anything less than 3.5 would be ultra acid, goes ultra, extremely, very strongly, strongly, moderately, slightly acid, all in the less than seven range. And we consider neutral soil to be 6.6 .6 to 7.3, very close to seven. And once you get above 7.3, you're in slightly alkaline, moderately alkaline, strongly alkaline, and very strongly alkaline is anything above pH 9. So here is a table that illustrates the availability of various essential nutrients at different pH levels. When you look at the essential elements, you can see that the width of the bar varies as you go through different pH values. So here, when we see green in color, that means it's the most available. And when we see red in color or the narrow bar, that means that's the least available. And there's no real numbers attached to this. It's more of a conceptual uh, table for you to observe. But even still, we can see some patterns. So if we look on the strongly acid side, we see that all of our top elements, and these are the macronutrients, will be in deficiency as we move into a strongly acid soil. By contrast, we can see that the micronutrients become deficient when we move into alkaline soil. Now, notice that we need to be strongly acid before we are limiting the availability of macronutrients. But compare that to how alkaline you need to be before you start to observe deficiencies in the micros. We're only in the slightly to medium alkaline range. So it's much more likely that you would observe the micronutrient deficiency in an alkaline soil then you will observe a macronutrient deficiency in an acid soil. You need to get very acid before you can observe that deficiency. So with these two regions of deficiencies, where then should we aim to have our soil? Well, yes, kind of right in that middle region between 6.5 and 7 very slightly acid soil, 
uh, gives us the best range of nutrient availability. Notice that we've got some uh, decreased ability to absorb iron and molybdenum, but it's still thick enough that it's kind of the sweet spot where you get everything that you possibly can. So that's our goal is 6.5 to 7. And in dry regions, we're on the alkaline side. In rainy regions, they're on the acid side. Now, each plant that we grow will be adapted for various pHs, but they all are happiest when they're within that uh, six to seven range. But if we look at some common garden crops, you can see that uh, various crops will have different tolerances. Some are more sensitive and require a very specific pH. Some are less sensitive and they can grow in a wider range of pH soils. So again, this is helpful information if you're working with soil that's on either side of the pH spectrum. Or if you want to grow something in particular, you can learn about that crop in order to amend your soil to get it within the target pH. How does soil pH affect the organisms? Well, if it becomes too acid, that will slow down decomposition of organic matter. Basically, it uh, kills off a lot of these organisms, and then the rate of decomposition slows. We know that decomposing organic matter is one of the primary ways that we make nutrients available in soluble form. So we want that process to always be continuing. That killing of organisms could sometimes be beneficial if you're trying to uh, worry about specific pests. For instance, a fungal disease known as damping off uh, would not occur in a highly acidic soil. So there may be some instances when you would benefit from being outside of that neutral range, but in most cases, we want to encourage as much life in the soil as possible. Additionally, if you are too acidic of a pH, you can release toxic amounts of some of our plant nutrients. And so iron, manganese, and aluminum can all become toxic at very low pH values or very acidic soil. And the images here are showing symptoms of toxicity from these elements. So your average pH will vary by location, and it's largely a factor of your climate based on how much rainfall you have. It's also a factor of uh, geography and the parent material, uh, plant cover, uh, biological activity. There's all sorts of different things that will affect your soil pH. But the most significant factor is rainfall, which has to do with how much leaching occurs in the soil. So you can see some generalized patterns here. If you look at uh, North America, the United States and Canada, you can see that on the East Coast of the United States, it's in the green area, which is on the acidic side of neutral. And then on the Western states, you see the grays and the blacks, which are on the alkaline side of neutral. There's one exception, and that's the state of Oregon, which is high in rainfall and has typically pretty good soil for growing plants. And that's where we get into an acidic soil. Now, it's not the case that just at the Oregon border, there's acidic soil, and then you cross into California or Washington and you hit alkaline soil. That's not how that works. It's just that when you take a look at the median pH, which is kind of the middle, Oregon tends to skew much more acidic than the rest of the states. So where do these hydrogen ions come from? In order to answer that question, we need to kind of dive into the water molecule and what's actually happening with water at any given moment. So water enters the soil and when it does, it exists as H2O. We know that H2O is water. However, because water is a polar molecule, uh, it's got a charge to it, 
it is constantly undergoing a small breakdown uh, from H2O into a hydrogen ion. And what's left over is a hydroxyl ion. So we have H plus and OH negative. So at any given moment, water is mostly made up of H2O, but some of those molecules will be splitting down into hydroxyl and hydrogen, breaking apart, coming back together. And at every any given moment, you've got a certain percentage or a certain amount or a concentration of hydrogen ions in water. So this is what we use to establish a baseline with which to judge all other substances for pH. So when we have a neutral atom, it's got a balance with a proton and an electron. The charge is balanced, positive and negative. If you lose one electron, you're left with the proton, that's called a cation. If you gain an electron, that's called an anion. These are just different terms to describe ions, uh, charged particles or charged compounds. And we give them different names based on whether they're positive or negative. So the cation is a positively charged particle. It's typically formed by elements that we consider to be metal. So metallic atoms will form cations. And examples of this are sodium, iron, and ammonium. See how they all have the plus, NH4 positive, for example. Now, when we look at the anion, that's negative. It's formed by non-metal atoms, and that's things like chloride, bromide, and sulfate. So in soil, we can measure something called the cation exchange capacity. It's abbreviated as the CEC. Every type of soil has its own exchange capacity, meaning how many cations can adhere to soil particles. There are various factors that will change the cation exchange capacity. One of those factors is how much clay is in your soil. If you have a lot of clay in your soil, you will have a greater CEC, a greater cation exchange capacity. And therefore, that soil will hang on to more nutrients that are available to your plants. So there's a little hidden benefit of clay soil. But additionally, the more organic matter you have in the soil, the greater the cation exchange capacity. And as your soil pH increases, so too does your cation exchange capacity increase. So you'll get an acidic soil when that soil is high in hydrogen ions. This typically occurs in areas of higher rainfall because in areas of higher rainfall, as the water passes through the soil, you will tend to have those hydrogen ions in the water replace the other cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, those get leached out and H plus is left behind. The more H plus you have in the soil, the more acidic your soil becomes. Your soil will also get more acidic from carbon dioxide that is released from organic matter. So the organisms responsible for decomposition, they go through respiration, they exhale carbon dioxide, they add CO2 into the soil pore spaces. That increased concentration of CO2 reacts with the water that's in the soil. And when it does, it creates something called carbonic acid and the byproduct is more H plus.
more hydrogen ions. Additionally, with the decomposition of organic matter, we've talked about the nitrogen cycle and how ammonium is a form of nitrogen that is able to be taken up by plants, and it's the byproduct of natural decomposition. It's also one of the bases of nitrogen-based fertilizers, ammonium. In the soil, when ammonium is oxidized by bacteria, it is transformed into nitrate, and during that process, hydrogen ions are released as well. So we go from ammonium, which is NH4, and we end up with nitrate, which is NO3. That H, the hydrogen had to go somewhere. It is given off in the form of water, H2O, and a couple of hydrogen ions as well. Sulfur is another element, sometimes that we add to the soil as a fertilizer, and sulfur in the soil will oxidize into sulfate, and in that process, we have hydrogen ions released. And finally, we have the plant roots themselves. They release hydrogen ions as they pull in other ions from soil particles. So as nutrients are pulled in from the soil particles, hydrogen ions, H plus, is left behind. And the root zone of your plants, in particular right next to those root hairs, can have such a high concentration of H plus that the pH can be a whole number lower than the pH of the surrounding soil. Remember, if it's a logarithmic scale, that means that your pH right by your roots is going to be 10 times more acidic than the pH of your soil in general. So now let's take a look at alkaline soils. There are three main characteristics of alkaline soils that result in poor plant growth. And the first one is excessive salt buildup. So remember, alkaline soils are typically areas where it doesn't rain very much. And because it does not rain, we don't get any leaching. And so salt can tend to build up. The salt can come from a number of places. Uh, the parent material may contain the salts. The seawater, if you're very close to the ocean, can actually blow salt in the air in the form of uh, water vapor, and that can impact your soil. But in our case, we probably have most of our salty soil coming from the irrigation water, which in and of itself is salty. That irrigation water travels a long distance to get to us, and it's not covered during its journey. And so all along, there's evaporation. When evaporation takes place, fresh water is removed, but all of the salts are left behind, and you end up with a concentration of salts in the water that's delivered to customers in arid regions. So when we apply irrigation water in the form of tap water to our plants, we are adding salty water. The salts in that water will persist in the soil and can even build up over time. If we get uh, very alkaline soils, especially if they have sodium-based salts, those can actually seal off. What ends up happening is you get a crust developing on the surface of the soil, and it tends to become hydrophobic. So you won't be able to have water properly flow through a sealed off soil. And then finally, with alkaline soils, if you have a very high pH, we know that there's going to be some micronutrients that are no longer available to our plants in soluble form. So we know there's passive and active absorption. Water is absorbed into the cell through osmosis, and that happens because there's a difference in salt concentration outside of the cell and inside of the cell. The plant can use energy to direct 
salts to the cell and increase the concentration of salt inside. And that enables the plant to pull in more water. That's called active absorption. But in very salty soils, it will be more difficult for the plant root to take in water because that concentration gradient will be less extreme. And in very salty soils, you may even have the condition that there's more salt outside than inside, and you can have the water flow in the, the wrong direction because it's always wanting to balance itself out. So if you've got salt problems, you'll notice them with a very specific symptom. You get what's called salt burn, and that's when you see uh, the margins of the leaves are, are dead. So it's not quite the same as any of our deficiency symptoms. This is caused by excessive salt in the soil, and some plants are more susceptible than others. The image shows an avocado tree, which is particularly susceptible. Avocados come from high rainfall areas, and we can grow them in San Diego. But with our alkaline soil and our salty irrigation water, we can very easily reach a condition that is harmful to the avocado. Uh, saltiness in the soil will reduce seedling germination and the survival rate of, of young plants. It'll cause plants to wilt faster. If your soil seals off and becomes crusted, then seeds won't be able to break through physically. And you'll just have overall mineral deficiencies as well. So we're going to switch gears here and uh, dive a little bit deeper into what pH actually means and how it was determined. Why are there 14 numbers? Why does the scale go from 0 to 14? Some of you may find this very interesting and exciting, and it will make you want to take a chemistry class. Some of you may find this to be a waste of time, but I'll try to explain it in a way that is at least easy to follow and hopefully gives you a better understanding of what we're talking about and why pH is the way it is. So in order to fully understand pH, we're going to dive into the chemistry and we're going to explain some terminology and look at some numbers. Don't let the numbers scare you away. They will prove a point in the end. So our first thing we're gonna do is talk about water which is what we've been talking about, H2O. And we're going to try to measure the number of molecules in a given weight of water. On the surface, that doesn't sound like an easy thing to do, uh, but we need to understand how scientists do this in order to fully understand pH. If we were going to try to put a single molecule of water on a scale and weigh it. We don't have any instrument that is able to do that. It's so small that nothing that we have can actually determine the weight of a molecule. One atom of hydrogen weighs a very, very, very small amount. You see all those zeros after the decimal point? So it's 1.7 times 10 to the negative 24 power. That's how small a hydrogen atom is. It's so small that that's a meaningless number. There's nothing that humans can use to relate to that. But in the history of chemistry, a scientist named Avogadro was able to determine how many atoms of hydrogen it would take to equal one gram. And he determined that it would be six, zero, two, three, and all the zero atoms. That's a huge number also. So it's abbreviated in scientific notation, 6.023 times 10 to the 23, 23 zeros. So that's how many hydrogen atoms are in one gram. 
So what this means is that if you can count 6.023 times 10 to the 23 power, if you can count that many atoms of hydrogen, you would end up with one gram of hydrogen by weight. You can see uh, one gram is visually represented as that one gram weight on the fingertip. You can think of it backwards. If you weigh out one gram of hydrogen, you will have 6.023 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen. And so because hydrogen is the smallest atom, it has been assigned the atomic weight of one. So therefore, if you look at the periodic table and you weigh out the atomic weight of any of the elements on that periodic table, you will end up with 6.023 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Scientists use this method in order to be able to mix equal numbers of atoms simply by weighing out their relative atomic weights in grams. So very simply, a mole is the equivalent of an Avogadro's number worth of atoms. So if you weigh out 6.023 times 10 to the 23 atoms of any element, you'll have one mole of that element. And we can also apply that to molecules. So as an example, let's see how much water we would need to weigh out in order to have one mole of water. So we look at uh, what water is made of, H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. So the atomic weight of hydrogen is one, where there's two of them, so that equals two grams. The atomic weight of oxygen is 16, so we do 16 plus two, so we would need 18 grams of water in order to have one mole of water. So now, knowing that, we can determine how many molecules are in any given weight of water. Now, at different temperatures, water can be heavier or lighter because it expands and contracts with temperature. But if we look at one liter of water, and if it's at room temperature, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, that would weigh 997 grams, the water itself. And knowing that 18 grams is one mole of water, we divide 997 by 18, you get 55.4. That's how many moles of water you need to make up one liter. So we can actually determine the number of molecules in that container. It's a huge number, but it's useful to be able to know that. So remember earlier, we mentioned that water, distilled water, pure water, H2O, at any given time, it will dissociate, break down into hydrogen and hydroxyl ions, OH negative and H plus. In fact, the number of hydrogen and hydroxyl ions is 0 0.000001 moles per liter. So if the total is 55.4 moles in one liter, then 55.399999 is regular water, but that 0 0.000001 will be in the form of H plus and OH negative. So with this information, we can conclude that the concentration of hydrogen ions in distilled water is 0 0.000001 moles per liter. Now, how many decimal places is that? <laughs> 
if we were to turn that into one, how many times would we have to move that decimal point? If you said seven, you would be correct. And we're getting somewhere. That number seven, that sounds like something familiar, doesn't it? A logarithm is a shortcut for expressing very large and very small numbers. So when we measure the logarithm, that is the number of times we need to multiply something or divide something by 10 in order to reach that very large or very small number. So for example, say you have 10,000, the log of 10,000 would be four because the number 10 must be multiplied by itself four times in order to get 10,000. So here we have a table showing the logarithmic scale. If we start with one, how many times do you multiply one by 10 in order to get one? Zero times. But you go up 10, you multiply once. 100, you multiply twice. And the same goes as you divide. You divide something by 10 once, it's 0.1. Divide it by 10 twice, it's 0 0.01. And so you can see as the number gets really large or really small, then we can use a shortcut to describe that in scientific notation, 10 to the power of one, 10 to the power of two, or very simply, we just say log one, log two. So getting back to pH, remember that distilled water had the concentration of 0 0.000001 moles per liter of hydrogen ions. Or we could now say that we had 10 to the negative seven or a log of negative seven. So the, so the true scientific definition is the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. Therefore, if we take the negative of negative seven, that is just seven. So the pH of distilled water is seven. And the pH of a neutral soil is also said to be seven. That's how we got seven in the first place. So the larger the numbers of H plus in the soil, the greater the concentration of hydrogen ions and the lower the pH because it's the negative log and the more acidic the soil becomes. So a pH of five will be 10 times more acidic than a pH of six and a pH of five will be a thousand times more acidic than a pH of eight. So every time we move numbers, we have to multiply or divide by 10. I hope that helps to clear things up. It's a bit abstract, but we talk about pH all the time when we talk about soil and nutrients available in soil. And a lot of people amend their pH and we have a general sensibility about acidity and alkalinity, we can somewhat imagine what that means and what that kind of looks and feels like. This is my attempt to explain to you scientifically uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about pH. And if any of this can stick in your mind and you can remember this, it may be easier in the future for you to remember how pH has an impact on soil management, on the growth of plants, the availability of nutrients, and how we can amend soil to try to get it into a target range, a range that is typically neutral and one that tends to favor the maximum nutrient availability and therefore the maximum plant growth. Thanks a lot.